Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi, my name is Monica. I like to post anti-MLM, so that's anti-multi-level marketing, life, and some true crime content here on this channel. So if any of that interests you, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I would love for you to stick around. In today's video, I'm going to be diving into part four of my Nexium series. So if you have not watched the first three parts, I, I have linked the playlist below for the Nexium series because it is going to get its own playlist. This part is going to go over DOS along with what one article called the Nexium Diet branding and subgroups that are associated with Nexium. With that said, this video might not be suitable for all viewers because it will go into sexual abuse along with eating disorders amongst other topics. So if that is something that you cannot listen to, I don't recommend watching this video. The topic of DOS is originally I thought it was going to be only in one video, but it's going to be split up into two because I am going to be sharing stories of other Nexium ex-cult members. So that's something that I just wanted to mention. If you're not familiar with what DOS stands for, it's a Latin phrase that translates to master over slave women. Before we proceed, I wanted to share a quote I found during my research for this part of the series. I think it's important to present this in a video because I'm sure a lot of cult victims have beat themselves up over joining a cult and wondering that there is something wrong with them for doing it. A Los Angeles therapist by the name of Rachel Bernstein said, quote, I've talked to about a thousand former cult members who will say, I feel like because I said yes to the first thing, I didn't have a right to complain about what happened to me afterward, end quote. It's sad that after being a victim to a cult, these members can possibly even think this way. That's why I'm so glad that there is help out there on how to deprogram from a cult. So without further ado, let's just move on to the video. Nexium has been associated with multiple different organizations. Jeunesse was for women, while the Society of Protectors was aimed predominantly at men. There was also the Rainbow Cultural Garden that was started in 2006, which is where children were exposed to reading seven different languages. Some Nexium members within the inner circle were reportedly taught that in their past lives, they were high ranking Nazis. Barbara Boucher was allegedly told she was a reincarnation of a Holocaust architect. Reinhard Heydrich and Nancy Salzman were allegedly reincarnations of Hitler, while Keith Rainier was a leader of anti-Nazi partisans. I know I've repeated myself numerous times, but I really wonder if Keith believed this to be true or if he was just outright lying to people. I would love to one day find out which one it is or if it's a little bit of both, but with all that being said, let's just get into the Society of Protectors. The Society of Protectors, or otherwise referred to as SOP, was founded in 2011. This group was supposed to build character and turn members, as per Mark Vicente, from little boys into men. Mark Vicente was born in South Africa on June 22, 1965. Mark was one of the prosecution's key witnesses in the Nexium trial. He's also married to Bonnie PC, who is an Australia-born musician and actress. The two met while they were both part of Nexium. Both Mark and his wife Bonnie were high-ranking within Nexium, and both of them became alarmed once they stayed in Nexium a little bit longer. Bonnie was worried about how obsessed the women had become regarding her weight. She was eventually able to convince Mark that they needed to get out of Nexium, that something more sinister was happening. They both left in 2017. There was an interview that Mark did where the interviewer said, I think it does a good job of explaining how a regular smart person might fall into something like this when speaking on the topic of the vow. Mark responded with quote, Exactly, and I think that's been done very well because one of the things that both Jahane and Karim, who were the vow directors, spoke about at great length was this idea that in order to have people understand how this works, they have to understand the dream. What was the thing that people fell in love with and felt attached to that had them stick around as long as they did, end quote. Mark said that for him, Nexium was a way for him to understand human behavior a little bit better. He does believe that for some people, they were yearning for community and purpose, and they found that with Nexium. I'll leave the interview that Mark did below if you'd like to read the entire thing, but back to SOP. As with most things within Nexium, to be part of SOP, you needed to pay to become part of this society. If you allegedly did what you were told in this group, you'd get your money back. 
SOP members would have these readiness drills, which were practiced just in case there was some kind of emergency. This group was supposed to teach men how to act with women. Somehow the society made so much money that it was hard for them to keep track of it, to report the earnings to the IRS. I wonder if that was an intentional error, allegedly. SOP would teach about how men are naturally polygamous and women are naturally monogamous. Women were told that they should accept that men are to have multiple sexual partners because it's natural and biologically right, while the woman could only be with one man. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm just internally screaming at this, but it only gets worse. SOP claims that women are spoiled and pampered and that men get the brunt of everything. Along with that, women and men were kind of in a way compared to dogs. The Vanguard, or otherwise known as Keith, said that if a man ejaculates on a woman, he's marking his territory like a freaking dog. I don't think my eyes can roll any further back into my freaking head at this point. The Rainbow Cultural Garden is what we're going to go over next. This was founded by Keith in 2006. This organization was supposed to be a revolutionary child development program promoting children's cultural, linguistic, emotional, physical, and problem solving potential. Children as young as two were exposed to be taught how to speak seven different languages at a young age. From my understanding, it seems like a child would be with a caretaker who spoke, let's say Spanish, and then they would quickly switch to a new caretaker who spoke, I don't know, let's say German. Rainbow Cultural Garden had 11 locations all around the world. There have been mixed opinions regarding this organization. Some think that this was just a way to squeeze out even more money from Nexium members who just so happen to be parents. Some child development specialists didn't think this organization was too damaging, but just difficult to achieve as a child, while others thought this would harm children and in turn, these children wouldn't be fluent in any language. This program was a daycare of sorts. It was never licensed as one. They had to shut one of the locations in Miami down in 2018 because of this very reason. However, cult expert Rick Ross spoke on this organization, quote, it wasn't about language. It was about indoctrinating children to be like him. He was the prototype and he was always interested in cloning himself and perpetuating his ideas. So to think that it was only ever simply about being multilingual is incredibly naive. It was never just about that. It was about him, his philosophy and perpetuating his world view, end quote. There was a similar program that was opened up in France in 2018. It's through a company called Athal Education Group where Sarah Brofman and her husband founded and financed. In December of 2018, Athal launched their program called Campus Beyond the School, which claimed that it would have children as young as two mastering their mind, body, expression, and world, while also learning the same exact seven languages that Rainbow taught, and those were German, English, Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, French, Japanese, and Russian. According to a former Nexium member, Ariella Menashi, who tried to open her own Rainbow School, said that Athal's program sounds 100% like Rainbow, even the languages were the same. Rick Ross would try and deter people from attending any schools or camps that are affiliated with Keith. He also said, quote, child protection officials should be looking very closely at those schools, end quote. Frank Parlato thinks that we should focus on the abuse that's happening there, quote, these children are being raised by a series of strangers who are not high paid, who are speaking to them in different languages every day. And the kids don't get a rest. They don't get the opportunity to just talk with their mother or be with their father, end quote. In 2010, Keith did say that he believed children would have a better time if they were brought up with three or five different cultures so that they can see themselves as something that is beyond those cultures. In December of 2017, an investigation was started into the UK Rainbow Cultural Program. Ofsted was the agency that started the investigation and they said that the allegations were extremely concerning. However, eventually, Ofsted closed the investigation, stating that the program doesn't need to register with the agency due to the parents remaining in the home with their children while they are being taught. I'm not 100% sure if they are still operating today, but I'd be worried if it was, especially with how much media coverage has surrounded Nexium. 
There was a school called Sunshine's Multicultural Academy in Guatemala City, and it seems as though it may have some kind of ties back to Rainbow. The reason being is because at one point, they use the Rainbow logo and they promote that young children have the opportunity to learn up to five languages. In September of 2018 is when the school removed all Rainbow logos and they changed their name to Sunshine's Guatemala. At the time of filming this in February of 2021, they posted just a few days ago. It seems as though they are still teaching multiple different languages. Now that we've gone over the subgroups that have to do with the men and children, let's move on to the women. Unlike Das, Janess didn't really have too much of a meaning behind the name besides one member who described it as, quote, a made up word that we are defining as we define who we are, end quote. It was started in 2006 and some articles say it was started by Keith while others say Pam Caffritz was also involved in starting this group. This organization claimed to be a women's movement that was supposed to explore what it means to be a woman. Allison Mack did have a comment about Janess back in 2013. She said, quote, working for Janess is the most gratifying thing I've ever done. It's the most challenging because it consists of working with a group of people who are interdependent. No one is ever punished or told what they're wrong or they're bad, end quote. I've noticed that interdependence has been brought up more than once with Nexium. If you remember from the part of this series about the sash color ranking system and the 12 point mission statement, within the mission statement, they spoke about interdependence quite a bit. The parts of the 12 mission statement that I'm referring to is number three and number nine. Interdependence has also been referenced in other articles I was reading, but in case you missed part two of this series, number three in the mission statement says, I'm committed to my success. I understand that we must all elevate ourselves and thus elevate all others, just as everyone else elevates us. This is interdependence. Number nine says, real success is never at the expense of others. As a successful individual, I will never envy someone else's success. I will rejoice because I understand that the success of others elevates me even a little, because I'm also part of the human team. The updating of human potential by anyone is a tribute to the whole humanity team. If others are successful, I will protect their success against those who envy them. I promise to free myself from all habits that are based in parasitism and envy and replace them with habits of effort and interdependence. And that's what was written in the 12 point mission statement. So working for Janice is grounding and satisfying and humbling and and wonderful, wonderful. Jeunesse promoted the type of thinking that men and women are wired differently. According to some testimonies, Jeunesse members were allegedly taught women are irresponsible, if not narcissistic, self-absorbed, and inclined to cast themselves as the victim. Um, what? Excuse me while I go puke in my mouth a little bit with this kind of sexist thinking. A Rolling Stone article that wrote about SOP talks about how men didn't experience the same depth of experience while women are less adept at understanding right and wrong. Then there was something that Lauren Salzman said, quote, women feel oppressed and the men would try to stick up for themselves and we would all attack them. We cut them off constantly just because we're excited and impulsive, but we didn't understand that they felt unheard or disrespected or uncared for, end quote. Oy. The workshops for Jeunesse were 11 eight-day workshops and cost Jeunesse members about $5,000 each. The Jeunesse website is no longer up, but when it was, it said that Jeunesse is a women's movement that facilitates an ongoing exploration of what it means to be a woman through open dialogue and development of friendships. Jeunesse engages women from all over the world and allows them to discover the true essence of womanhood. The members of Jeunesse were encouraged to use hashtags such as what makes a woman and Janessing. Surprisingly enough, the Janess Instagram account is still up, although their last post was from 2017. I'm a little shocked though that it's still up given how much coverage this has gotten and the nature of what Janess actually stood for. Glamour published an article that was dedicated to speaking about Das and Janess. In that article, they are talking about a testimony for a woman who was part of Janess. This woman that they identify as Sylvie spoke about how Janess was unorganized and haphazard. When Sylvie told Keith what she thought of the program, he allegedly berated her, told her she was cold hearted and that her children wouldn't love her. Even with all of this, Sylvie went back to the group. Janess was supposed to empower women and help for you to grow and overcome obstacles. After Sylvie attended these courses, she heard about DOS. 
Sylvie, along with other members, were torn down and built back up as a cult does. Janji Lalik, a California-based cult specialist and sociologist, reportedly said, quote, we have all kinds of people that we use for sounding boards and we get reality checks. All of a sudden, you're in Albany and you've got all these pressures working on you all the time and you've got nobody to whom you can say, do you think this is weird, end quote. Janja also spoke about how cults nowadays are looking for career-driven people, participants who are productive because this means that they will work hard in building this company or cult along with broadening the reach with their social networks and people who have money. This makes a lot of sense because these people can be actual slaves but be productive ones or ones that can build the cult disguise as a business. Something to also keep in mind if you've ever been targeted for something such as a cult or if you were targeted at a vulnerable spot in your life, Janja also says, quote, we all have vulnerability points and that's not a mental illness. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, but all of us throughout life have experiences or moments where we're vulnerable, which means we're open and we're a little raw. So if at the moment someone comes along and says, here, let me help you, you're open to that. You'll take that risk, end quote. If we bring this back to the anti-MLM content I usually make on this channel, that's what these MLM companies do. That's why you always hear reps telling you their sob story or their rags to riches story. It's because you can relate to them if where they were before the MLM is the same situation as your current one. When you're yearning for something so bad, if someone comes along and dangles this dream in front of you or this is the thing that you're looking for, your critical thinking may just go out the window. That is why I present my anti-MLM content the way that I do. Anyway, back to Janesse. There was one woman by the name of Nicole who borrowed money from her parents to attend these courses. She was an actress who didn't want to be just an actress. She wanted to be a great actress. There was a time where she started feeling suicidal and she decided to call Allison Mack. This was the perfect opportunity for Allison to pitch DOS. Allison disguised DOS as a women empowerment group that you would have to pay money for. What was strange for this group is you had to provide collateral. This included nude photos or videos, embarrassing information, money, etc. Sounds a little bit like blackmail if you ask me. The women were told that this was so that the secret of DOS wouldn't be spoken about because it was, at the end of the day, a secret society. Nicole was a little nervous about having to provide collateral because that would mean that this was a long-term commitment, maybe even a lifelong commitment, but she wanted to be mentored by Allison. I mean, I really can't blame her because here you have this celebrity, this actress, that maybe even Nicole aspired to be, and she's willing to mentor you. Along with that, let's not forget about Nicole's mental state at the time. She was vulnerable. Nicole was told that her third assignment within DOS was to reach out to Keith. Then once she finally got a response, Allison allegedly told Nicole to meet Keith and do anything he asked her to. According to Nicole, eventually she was blindfolded and brought to an unknown location. She was told to get on the table where her wrists and feet were tied. There was another person in the room, and I won't get into too much detail, but this other person started performing sexual acts on Nicole. She didn't know that this was going to happen to her, and allegedly, while Keith was in the room as well, he said that nothing bad would happen to her and that she's a young woman who's allowed to be sexual. I really cannot imagine what was going through her mind when this was happening or what was said to her throughout all of her time with Nexium. Now that you know a little bit about Nicole's story and how courageous she was to tell her story during the trial, I want to talk a little bit more about DOS. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, DOS stands for a Latin phrase that translates to master over slave women. This was a high control group where women had a slave master type relationship. The reason why the HBO series The Vow was called that is because they called DOS The Vow. Just as the other two groups that I spoke about, the SOP and Jeunesse, DOS also required you to give them collateral and money to join. They were put on what some have called the Nexium diet, which was anywhere from 500 to 800 calories a day. I've seen a few different numbers when it comes to the calories consumed, however, 500 is the most popular. I did speak to Kat Benson from Unlock Nutrition here on YouTube, and she said that 1200 calories is lowest recommended. 
unless with doctor oversight for very specific reasons. And even then 1200 is way lower than what CAT has people do because it can slow metabolism and increases risk of nutrient deficiencies. The New York Times reported that Keith called DOS a sorority and Allison Mack said it was supposed to be a way for these women to aspire to be better and quote, DOS was about women coming together and pledging to one another a full-time commitment to become our powerful and embodied selves by pushing on our greatest fears, by exposing our greatest vulnerabilities, by knowing that we would stand with each other no matter what, by holding our word, by overcoming pain, end quote. However, DOS was a little more sinister than these people were letting on. The women of DOS were sex slaves and there were plenty of times where they posed, allegedly, together naked for what they called their family photos. What these women didn't know at first was that these family photos were being secretly sent to Keith. DOS had more than 50 slaves in eight different groups and one group for each first line master. While these women thought that other women were their masters, they weren't aware that Keith was the ultimate master. Two DOS slaves did share their stories at the trial and they said that they would not have joined DOS if they knew a man was in charge all along. The whole idea of the ESP classes, which also translated into a lot of these subgroups such as DOS, was what one article called a lot like the new age psychological idea of radical responsibility where an individual takes charge of everything in their life, even if they aren't at fault. In other words, they were trying to teach you that everything is your responsibility, even if you really had no control over what happened. Essentially, this made it easier for the members or slaves to be gaslit. If you don't know what that term means, it's a form of psychological manipulation in which a person or group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or group, making them question their own memory, perception, or judgment. I was reading about how The Vow did present a phone call between Sarah Edmondson and her master, Lauren Salzman. During this phone call, Lauren said that because Sarah joined us, it was her choice to be branded even though Sarah was not made aware of the branding until not too long before it happened. When you think of branding, you think of animals, right? This is still something that happens to this day when it comes to branding animals. However, this was happening to women within DOS. Originally, the idea was to get a little tattoo that came from Allison Mack, that was her idea, and somehow it turned into branding instead. Sarah Edmondson spoke about the night she was branded. She was taken to a hotel and had been blindfolded and told to take all of her clothes off. After her blindfold was taken off, she saw that she was in a room with other naked women from Nexium. They were driven to a secret location and that's when they started branding each woman with a branding pen. The brand was supposed to represent the four elements. However, after Sarah looked at the brand a little closer, she saw that it looked like Allison's initials and then if you turned it to the side, it looked like Keith's initials. Sarah later said that the branding was worse than childbirth. The woman who allegedly branded 13 women was a doctor by the name of Danielle Roberts. I've seen some use Mad Doctor as her nickname and I think it's very fitting given what she allegedly did. Danielle is an osteopathic physician. I actually had to look up what an osteopathic physician was because I was curious to know what it meant and it's a branch of the medical profession in the United States. These types of physicians are licensed to practice medicine and surgery in all 50 states and are recognized to varying degrees in 85 other countries. In 2018, even after people were made aware of what Danielle had allegedly done, she did try to recruit people into joining her wellness group. According to witness accounts and federal court documents, these women who were being branded were held down by other members and this process could take up to an hour. These women were supposed to send photos of the brand every day for a month and then once a week for the following month. These photos were then supposed to be sent to Danielle. I'm going to be hopeful that this was to check up on it and make sure that there was no infection. The Daily Mail had written an article in 2018 that said at that point in time, even after multiple reports, Danielle was cleared of any wrongdoing by the New York State Board of Health. In that same article that reported on this wellness group, it said that they had learned there was a Nexium member who was supposed to speak at a medical conference about holistic healing. And this is where Danielle was promoting her membership about her wellness group. 
Her group was called EXO or ESO, which is a program that's designed to build total mastery over the physical, emotional, and thought components of human performance. As with a lot of things nowadays, it was really expensive, costing $750 for one class. The conference members were offered a 10% discount if they signed up within 72 hours. I'm not surprised that Danielle used FOMO as a way to get people to sign up. This isn't anything new and it's a very, very common marketing tactic in any industry. There was a group rate offered if people signed up in force. On March 5th of 2020, the State Department of Health's Board of Professional Medical Conduct did charge Danielle, the 39 year old, of practicing medicine with gross incompetence and gross negligence, morally unfit conduct, practicing fraudulently or beyond the scope, performing services not authorized by the patient and failing to maintain records. The board was also alleged that on March 9, 2017, Danielle betrayed her medical license when she branded the 13 women within DOS. Then she failed to report a flu-like communicable disease outbreak where attendees at a 2016 YMCA event were severely infected. This YMCA event included 438 people, 76 of those were children. It just so happened that this is where Nexium held an annual week-long celebration of Keith's birthday. An article that was published on coleducation.com on December 24, 2020, stated that Danielle faces the possibility of losing her medical license or at the very least having it suspended and having to pay a fine. Danielle had the audacity to say, quote, for me to have a conversation with family members and experience that no matter what I say, because that seed has planted that we've been brainwashed, everything I've said has been invalidated. I think it really damages the way that women are viewed. I think it damages ownership in general for people. You know, I think it gives people an out essentially to not take responsibility for their choices and their decisions. And it is ultimately extremely, extremely destructive. And especially for the women's empowerment movement, end quote. Danielle, you allegedly branded women. You allegedly used a cauterizing iron for about an hour to brand the initials of Keith Rainier and Allison Mack on 13 women. How do you expect people to react and view you? Even if let's say this wasn't called a sex cult, the branding alone as a doctor who used no anesthetic and saw women being held down by people along with screaming is disgusting. How could you do that? That's a serious question if she ever comes across this video. Now I understand that she may still be allegedly indoctrinated into this cult, but if she's not and she actually believes what she's saying, she's a vile human being. There was another medical professional whose medical license was revoked in 2019. This was a Brandon Porter. Brandon Porter, a medical doctor, was the one who allegedly basically used 200 people in an experiment. This is what some have referred to as a fright study. During this fright study, Brandon was recording EEG responses as his victims watched footage of people being murdered, decapitated, and other disturbing videos. Then in 2016, that same event that Danielle was at where she failed to report a flu-like outbreak, Brandon was there too. Because Brandon also failed to report this outbreak, he was in violation of his duties as a licensed medical doctor. Just a few years later, his license was revoked. I'm sure for victims of both Danielle and Brandon, many of them were hesitant to trust doctors once they were out of this cult. This is where I'm going to end part four. Part five will continue the discussion about DOS along with going over Sarah Edmondson and India Oxenberg's story a little bit further. That is what I have for you guys today. Let me know what you thought of this video. Let me know what you think of the series so far. Do you have anything to add to the discussion? I would love to hear your guys' comments below. And I guess with all that said, thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys next time. And this is Monica reporting to you live from a highway. Bye.